Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to another bonus episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where we bring you conversations with experts in fields related to urban farming and dive a little deeper into some important issues of our times. Bill McDorman is the executive director of Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance in Ketchum, Idaho. He got his start in the bioregional seed movement while in college in 1979 when he helped start Garden City Seeds. In 1984, he started Seeds Trust High Altitude Gardens, a mail-order seed company he ran successfully until he sold it in 2013. He authored the book Basic Seed Saving in 1994. Then in 2010, he and his wife, Bell Starr, created Seed School, a nationally recognized week-long training. Bill is a passionate and knowledgeable presenter who inspires his audiences to learn to save their own seeds. Tonight, we're here with Bill McDorman, and Greg with a very rusty voice. I've had a cold all week, so Bill's going to get to do most of the talking tonight, and Bill has been at the eighth session of the Governing Body International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resource for Food and Agriculture in Rome, Italy. Wow. I'll bet that was an amazing place to be for the past week, Bill. It changed me. I had no idea. You know, we hear about the United Nations. We hear about, the, you know, the nations of the world trying to come together and solve things like uh, climate change and other things. And it was just amazing to witness them coming together around something that's been near and dear to my heart my whole life. And that was, you know, seeds. This is all about seeds. What do we do with them? This is the International Treaty on Plant, plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. It's the seeds for the things we eat. And the world is having a big debate over it right now. And they come together every two years, the governing body, to discuss the the important issues of the day. And I'll um, outline some of those because I think they just reinforce how important it is for us all to continue to do what we do. Yeah. And that is... So before you you go any farther, how did you get invited? That's what I want to know. Well, that was very interesting. We had a delegation from Zimbabwe come to our seed summit in Santa Fe this past year. And so every two years, we try to get together every all of our seed savers and seed stewards, and we met in Santa Fe. And Andrew Mushita came from what they call the CTDT, or the, let's see if I can say it correctly, it's an organization in Zimbabwe that does what we do in a way. I mean, it's a different society, but they're basically doing seed schools for farmers and teaching farmers how to grow and save their own seeds and then have advanced and set up uh, programs to help them make sure that those seeds are of the highest quality and that they can be shared with other farmers. And so Andrew was so impressed, I guess, with what we were doing in the Rocky Mountain West. He said, you have got to come to Africa or come to Rome for the eighth session of this treaty. And and to tell you the truth, I just, I heard about it. I knew it was important, but I really didn't know that much about it at the time. And so we were lucky enough to get some funding this past year. Thank you so much to the people that stepped up and helped us go, because I think it's going to be really important for our organization going forward. And so we actually got to present at this conference, the main sessions, the plant plenary sessions that happen every day are where there are votes on different proposals that are being made to the convention as a whole. And then at lunchtimes and in the evening, they had what they called side events. And that's where lots of new, interesting topics are discussed and introduced to the treaty. And we were part of one of those side events. And so I was really honored that we were asked to do that. Nice. Nice. So tell me about the conference itself. Well, yeah, you know, it's basically the conference is a session of what they call the governing body. And it turns out that the United Nations is organized like this around all all sorts of topics about children, about health. And we know, you know, the one uh, that's probably been most in the news around the world lately is the one on climate. And so when there's a real protocol that's been set up over the life of the United Nations now about how to do that, what kinds of rules are followed, you gavel the session into order and there are, there's an agenda that has to be passed and then there are proposals and once a proposal is put in front of the the session, um, uh, the countries, what they call the contract parties to the, in this case, the treaty, 
their representative from each nation has a chance to intervene if they want and and say what you know they want to say about each of the proposals and then there's a after each of the proposals there's move to see if they can come to some consensus about what they've decided and actually then change the treaty a bit so that's basically what we were witnessing you know I, as I tried to say to a friend of mine we had third base you know box seats just above the dugout you know to watch this whole thing it was just an incredible display and and this eighth session this is the eighth time in 15 years that the that the governing body has come together this was a particularly interesting important session at least that's how it was built going in and it's because there are some big issues on the table on the one hand the developed countries of the world, which is the United States and Canada and parts of Europe, especially sometimes called now the global north, because those countries are basically in the northern hemisphere. They want access to the world's genetic diversity for plants and uh, plant genetic diversity for food and agriculture. And their, you know, their urgency is that we have to feed 10 billion people and it's going to take us. We've got the firepower to breed new crops. And we even have the firepower now to genetically modify them. And we've got to get to work and we're going to need all the diversity that we can. We need access to everything. We never know when, say, a disease resistant gene is going to be found somewhere that we haven't looked yet. So So they're really pushing hard. That's the first world's conversation to gain access to all the genetic diversity. Right. That's it. And the developing nations as we'll call it, or sometimes now called the global south, because most of those countries are in uh, near the equator or south of it, they want benefit sharing. They're saying these plants that you want access to, especially the food varieties, have been developed over the last 10,000 years by us, by indigenous people, by farmers, smallholder farmers that live in these countries. I don't, Craig, I learned there are 90 million farmers in Ethiopia you know, there's 55 million in, in India. You know, you just go around the world and you realize, well, they say it's 70% of the world's food is produced by smallholder farmers on, on between one and three hectares, which would be what? Between two and six or seven acres. Acres, yeah. Wow. Acres. And, and they're the ones without question that have created the world's diversity for food crops by growing and saving seeds over the millennia in their farms to adapt everything to where they are. And so they have it. They've got this material and the global north wants it. And they're saying, we're not going to give it to you now unless there's some sort of sharing of the billions of dollars that is now brought in from the sale of seeds from varieties that are have been developed by the global north using that genetic diversity. It's really an interesting time to watch because there's there's always been arguments over this. But up until now, I don't think the global south was as aware of what they have. And, and what as, was being swiped uh, from them. And what was being swiped from them. And as organized. They are organized. They have huge organizations, peasant organizations, and NGOs and CSOs, they call them now, civil society organizations, what we call nonprofits, all over the world are organizing them and giving them voice. They all have cell phones now. You know, the world is changing rapidly. And so they vote in a block. And the treaty itself has had 140 nations sign it. So there's 140 nations of the, what, the 200 and some that are really active in the world. 140 of those have signed this treaty now to govern how these plant genetic resources are um, used. How the U.S.? The U.S. just signed it for the first time. This we year? refused up to last year. And this is wow. the first treaty that they've attended. And they've, they've basically have not needed to or wanted to up to this point until they finally realized that they need access to this material also. I mean, they already have access to huge amounts of material through what they call the SIGAR system, which are 11 huge gene banks that have been set up around the world, basically with Rockefeller money in the beginning and governments now and that are run through the United Nations now. But it was all set up during the Green Revolution. And so those gene banks hold millions of varieties, and and those, a lot of those varieties were stolen. I'll just use the word in one way. I mean, they, you know, we, uh, that's one way of looking at it. Samples were brought to those banks, 
And now they want more nations of the world to put backups and to put materials into this system. And they're calling the system now the MLS, the multilateral system. I think sort of because the computer is getting pulled together. And so the developing countries don't want to put any more material into those banks or make anything else available to the developed countries until this treaty comes to some sort of an agreement over benefit sharing. How are you going to share the benefits with the people that actually stewarded and produced arguably all these materials? And so there was, there's always great hope going into one of these sessions. They have uh, working groups, you know, committees, so to speak, that meet in between for the two years. And there was, there'd been working groups working on the hardest issues. But when they came together at this treaty, it was really apparent nobody wanted to move. Nobody wanted to, to really address or, you know, compromise enough to reach an agreement on benefit sharing. And so, and so it was really an interesting, yeah. Go ahead. I'm gonna put I'm gonna put something out there. They shouldn't budge because, and this is the you know the global South thing. So many things have been pilfered over the past you know three four hundred years. You know they deserve fair share of what they've created. You know Don't the you the argument on the other the argument on the other side is that you're all poor small farmers, and what you need to do is come up to speed with modern agriculture. And the way to do that is to get better seeds that we need a new green revolution. And so we want to come into your countries with our hybrids and our genetically modified crops and increase yields in your countries. And that will make you better. So and the green revolution, that, uh, go ahead in return for that. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. You know, so if, if, you know, the green revolution came out of the sixties was, you know, developed agriculture's industrial agriculture's attempt to industrialize the agriculture around the world. Yeah. And, uh, I, I introduced- take great offense. When I was when I was back in school at Arizona State University in the early aughts, late nineties and early aughts, you know, we studied the Green Revolution and I take offense to that name because it really wasn't green at all. It was really needed yeah. to be called the chemical revolution. Yeah. Well and that's it. The the package comes in. So the you know, the some of you know what? I, you know some of the things I learned are just amazing. So if you're there, there are fifty, there are seventy, no, ninety countries in Africa, and fifty-five of them are all organized together, really, and we're really strong here at the treaty, and they wow. vote in a block, and they've decided wow. not to. And so you know, you've got one country, the United States, one country, Canada. You know, you've got a few in Europe and around on one side, and you've got fifty-five countries voting in one block. They have tremendous power. Nice. To help decide the future of the treaty. And so they've, they've decided that they're not going to give in until there's some sort of sharing, benefit sharing of the billions of dollars that are being made off these resources. That's one thing. But if you're one of those countries in Africa and you do want to develop and you want to, you know, there are things, there's irrigation equipment and there are techniques that could help your farmers. And there's also other countries that could buy your goods, things that are naturally produced that you could naturally produce, you know, and trade with other countries. Well, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, has basically set it up through an agreement they call TRIPS so that these countries cannot join the WTO and take benefit of these trade agreements unless, get this, unless they allow intellectual property law to be enforced within their countries. And by that, I mean plant patents. And so um, people are... You know, they, they're being, wow. um, in a way, hoodwinked. Now, there yeah. is an exception in some of the, in some of the WTO language. There is, there, there is allowance for an exception. And if a, a country absolutely does not want to recognize plant patenting, they don't have to. But these countries aren't told that in the negotiations or when they sign trade agreements with basically the United States. They sign on to agree to the most restrictive intellectual property patents there are on plants, utility patents, United States style, which means that those farmers can't, they're not even supposed to allow those plants to go to seed, let alone save their own seeds anymore. And so there's about 40% of the countries, these developing countries that have signed into these agreements and aren't allowed to, farmers aren't allowed to save their own seeds. Unless they're, especially the ones that are registered and protected. In some of the countries, the language even goes further and says you can't sell or share seeds unless they are 
registered or patented, which takes them out of seed saving altogether and makes them totally wow. dependent. And so they're, you know, they're, <laughs> it's really so this interesting. Is what, this is what this treaty is helping stop? Well, that was the hope, you know, that was the hope. But, and the original treaty talked about, it brought together really disparate points of view, as I'm pointing out. One side wants access to everything and the other wants, uh, you know, some resources to be returned that could help the farmers that have produced it. And there was always a hope on every um, session of the governing body over the last 15 years that they would somehow come to an agreement about how much and and how that was going to work. And there's been a general agreement in place for benefit sharing for farmers, but it's voluntary. And basically, the, the rich countries of the world have not given anything or very, very little, pennies on the dollar. And so now they're saying, no, that's it. You want access to everything? Before we expand access to anything else, you ha- we have to set up some sort of benefit sharing that will assure that we take part in the riches that are created out of this. And so that's the major block of the treaty. But let me throw in one other branch real quick, because there's a new development. And it just, by the time it was digested, and I think the second day, started the first day, second day of this session, it thinks ground to a halt. And that's called DSI. So I want everybody to listen to this, because you're going to hear more and more about it. It's called Digital Sequence Information. Digital Sequence Information. It has now come out of nowhere in the last, you know, three to four to five years to become the center argument point in this treaty. And so what is it? Well, it turns out that the ability to sequence DNA is um, getting cheaper and more common. And companies and people all over the world now are doing DNA sequencing. So they're mapping the chromosome, so to speak, and finding the location of all the alleles on it so that they actually get, that's a roadmap. They know where everything is and they can identify those genes. And so what it means is, uh, is the developing or the developed countries are using this to speed up breeding. If they're looking for a specific gene for disease resistance, say, they don't have to grow plants out anymore. They can just take a little piece of tissue culture, even from a seed and sequence the DNA and see if it's in there. And if it is, then they can grow out and, and, and grow the plant and use it in their breeding. Otherwise, they just don't have to deal with it. And so it saves huge amounts of time and money. But they can also do something else now with their new genetic ing- editing techniques using CRISPR. And that's another topic that we should probably do a whole show on. Oh, about that, yes. Well, about how they, they, they claim that they're able now to edit you know, genes pretty, pretty completely and pretty accurately. And so it turns out now that the developed countries may not even need access to the actual seeds in some cases from these countries if they have the digital sequence information about those plants. And so in the last few years, countries like Canada, especially is on this, but there are a number of databases available in the United States where people are, these are publicly accessible databases. Corporations have had their own that are private when they do the work, but there's a lot of digital information out there now of these gene sequences. And so turns out, and we heard an incredible story about a variety, a disease-resistant variety that was created because someone had got the digital sequence information of a wild crop relative that was resistant to a disease and using gene editing techniques, put that together in a laboratory from existing varieties that they had. And they didn't even have to go get that plant, the wild plant, to come up with a new variety that was disease resistant. And so now the developing countries, the global south, are saying, hey, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You guys have come in and taken all our stuff you put it in gene banks and now you're digitally sequence you know you're 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 getting the digital sequence information the dsis from all of our, these plants from all the work we've done for 10,000 years and now you don't even need us and you're using that information to create new varieties that you're making money from and we don't get any benefit sharing from that and now we're starting to see put together companies that are specializing in just dsi And selling that information. And they're starting to make money. And so all of this came from the original seeds. 
and the plants that these smallholder farmers created. And there's billion dollar industries making money off of it and they're not getting any. And so before there'll probably be any more discussion in the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, they're going to have to solve the problem of what they call DSI. Will that be part of the treaty? Is that the same as plant material? Is a picture of the genetic sequences of a plant the same as a plant? And if it can be sold, shouldn't there be benefit sharing around that also? Wow. What a complicated world we live in. Right. Wow. So what was one of the more startling things that you saw in a week at this conference? Well, the most startling thing was right in the middle of it, in the big hallway. This is the this is the United Nations Center for Food and Agriculture in Rome. It's right across the street from the Circus Maximus. It's in an incredible location. It's a huge building. Thousands of people work there from all over the world. And they've got this huge big atrium in the middle with a kind of a, a, a presentation place. And they had a very special presentation. And the ambassador, the, U, the new U.S. ambassador to, to the Vatican. I didn't know we, the Vatican is an independent nation. Did you know that? I did actually. The, yeah, that was a deal that they made with Mussolini during World War II and uh, for the church to agree not to uh, go against Mussolini while he was in power, he gave them their own nation, <laughs> their homeland to be their own nation in, in Rome there. And so we have, a, we have an ambassador to the Vatican and the ambassador to the Vatican herself came and introduced three scientists from the United States to talk about the future of feeding 10 billion people using genetic editing, CRISPR. And the whole thing was the most astonishing, delusional propaganda presentation I've ever seen in my life. And the ambassador is Newt Gingrich's wife, just to get started. And it was just amazing. <laughs> wow. was, I, I, I realized that, you know, and I, I guess this is why the treaty isn't working, isn't going to work. In the future is because we're living on different planets. Yeah. You know, they really believe, they really believe that they're going to save everybody by pulling apart genes and putting them back together now. Even though there's no real evidence that any real people, that especially the 2 billion people that are nutritionally challenged, let alone starving on the planet, have not benefited at all. And they want to patent everything, which means nobody... The people that need food the most wouldn't be able to afford it. Yeah. I guess the single statement that was most amazing to me was a gentleman that represented 150 new biotech companies that are doing gene editing was there. And he was saying that CRISPR gene editing is so safe that it's actually safer than traditional plant breeding. <laughs> that is arrogant. How, how? What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody understands that, uh, write in or get in touch with me because I sure would like to have a conversation about that. About that, yeah. Because exactly. I don't understand. Yeah. I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, well, and you know, this good. goes this goes to what our friend Toby Hemingway used to say all the time: "Nature always bats last." Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, and I quote it, I love the people that we've all been studying with and, and down through the years and the people that have been our guides. I quoted Paul Hawken when it was my turn to speak. Yeah. He said rather eloquently, you can't design elegant system from command central. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, really- let let everybody have a role in designing their own system. Yeah. You know, that farmers' rights have to be more than an exception to patent laws. That's how they talk about it now in Africa. Well, maybe we can give farmers a few more rights. No, Uh being a farmer is a fundamental right. Yeah. It just is, you know, and we have to learn to recognize that. And so when in the session I was in, you would have loved this, Greg. I had everybody in the in the room raise their hand if they themselves actually grow and save seeds. <laughs> and, How many people you know, were there in the, was room? the room where we were speaking, maybe 30 to 40 people in our uh-huh. side session. And I'd say 10 of them. And I would, and our side session was all about empowering smallholder farmers. Yeah. And so we had, a, you know, these are the people that are on our side. But it, in that moment, when I asked that and saw the hands go up, I thought about the general session itself, where there's 140 representatives from around the world. And I'll bet if you ask them, none of them 
None of them were yeah. raised together. Very, very few. Maybe they're from Africa. You know, there's some really great people in, in Latin America. But, you know, and, and they're all in favor of smallholder farmers because they get it. You know, on the one yeah. hand, to call them, oh, these poor farmers need our help and our, in our patented varieties in order, you know, to join the real world and feed themselves. And on the one hand, that's how they're seen. And then on the other, they're the ones that developed all the food we eat. Right. With what they already know over 10,000 years. And there's just no reconciling those two views. You know, you either have it one way or the other, it seems. And I don't know how to bridge that gap. You know, it it's just seemed arrogant. like an impossible. Yeah. About, uh, oh my gosh, when was 1996? That was 20 some years ago. I was writing one day and this came out of my, out of my writing. I just wrote it down. Our downfall as a species is that we're arrogant enough to think we can control Mother Nature and stupid enough to think it's our job. <laughs> That's right. right. Yeah. Yeah. No, these guys think it's their job to go right. in and ruin the last of these indigenous and smallholder farm communities. You know, instead of just listening to them tell you what they need. Right. You know, to develop their own systems and their own varieties. And it'll be really interesting to see how they go forth. So, you know, I think what's going to happen is that they're just going to get stronger. And it, the I learned about there are approximately 72 now seed-saving organizations throughout Europe and Eastern Europe that are, that are now starting to link themselves up. We we were lucky enough to have representatives come from a Greek seed-saving organization, Politi, came to our seed summit, and they've invited us to Greek, Greece this next April oh, to their nice. seed festival. And so, but they're just one. These things are are popping up all over. And it's not just the developing world. It's the developed world is starting to figure this out. I met Francois from Switzerland, which has one of the coolest seed saving organizations I've ever seen. I mean, these people, it's like well, Swiss watch precision. They've organized to save 1,600 varieties of vegetables and grains and flowers that they're taking care of in 12 public gardens throughout Switzerland. And they pass around the seeds and people um, get seeds and then return twice as much and they make them available to other people. It's the same nice. principles we're using at the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. And so you get to see. And so, you know, I guess that's the best thing that came out of the conference for us is that we got to meet and talk to these these warriors, these organizers, the people that are that are on the on the front lines of these things all over the world. Met people from Brazil and Argentina and from Kenya. And then Andrew was there from Zimbabwe. I met the representative from the African Union from South Africa, who is a real strong voice. I met people that work for the ETC group, which is, I'll say, an environmental policy group out of Canada. But they have offices in the Philippines, and they're working on farmers' rights and seed biodiversity in the Philippines. And so it was just wonderful. To, for us to sit there and realize that, you know, what we're doing, I'll say this, if you're, if you're a member of Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, you know, feel proud. We're right there. We're hooked in now better than ever with the world to our brothers and sisters that are going to help us do this. We've got the goods. And by that, I mean, we understand the most important part of this. And that is empowering people everywhere to do this. I mean, I have no doubt that there could be improvements in Africa and Latin America and all even in, in our towns all over with new varieties that could be brought in that would be more disease resistant or better yielding or whatever. I don't think we can totally dismiss modern agriculture, but to come in with a market-based system and have the, those varieties patented so nobody can save their own seeds and adapt them themselves, I think is where the real crime is. And to lose sight of the fact that you can trust people everywhere to learn how to do this work. And that before you go spending hundreds of millions of dollars genetically engineering new things or creating new hybrids and creating this new distribution system to come save, you know, the poor farmers of the world, before you do that, spend a one one hundredth of that money and teach them how to do it themselves. That's what we're doing. It's the most cost effective thing happening. And I've seen example after example after example of it starting to sprout up all over the world and organizations, Oxfam, when I was in college, Oxfam out of food relief program out of Great Britain. Now that's what they're doing. They had a banner up 
proclaiming how many seed schools they've had, how many right. farmers they've trained now, how many community seed banks that they've created. They're doing the same thing we are. It's really the only answer. It's the only, you know, I these guys will blow all the wind they can, but I just don't think they're here long. I don't think they're looking at the right things. I don't know. It'll be really interesting to see yeah. how far this goes down the road. But So I probably said enough. Um, you said there are some questions tonight, we too. We have a bunch of questions. I mean, let's, well, hope let's, my, have, uh, let's do some questions. Yeah, let's hope my voice lasts on this. First of all, for those of you out there that are listening that are in seed school right now, we are just about ready to ship out your mega seed bundles that we promised you. You should have those in the next two to three weeks. So no, no, we're getting those together. It's quite a project to uh, put together the bundles for you. And so we're, we're getting that done. So sit tight on that. Steph from San Luis says, in your experience, how do seed conservation projects help alleviate poverty? <laughs> wow. Well, right. I could give you, well, poverty, lots of times, the number one need is food, access to good food. The poorest uh, areas of our country are food deserts in and around some of our big cities, even. And there have been some really great programs about growing fresh organic food in, you know, urban agricultural settings in inner cities that not only get good nutrition to people for the first time, but then empower them to take care of themselves. And lots of times that's the, the key idea is people all of a sudden learn a new skill and learn that they can take care of themselves. And that can be one of the first and most important steps out of poverty. And I sound like I'm talking, you know, theoretically, but I, that's what they're doing at the food bank in Tucson, Arizona, at the Community Food Bank, where they have community gardens and teach gardening classes and have their own seed library so that people can have access to free seeds and they teach them how to save their own seeds. And the gardeners in this garden program that then show promise and want to continue and need more land to grow, the food bank now has a farm and they uh, give each of these people a larger plot of land so they can actually start to grow some things to sell as well as feed themselves. And seeds are an integral part of that whole process. So I think that's I have one a, answer. Yeah, I actually have an interesting story about that. I'm going to guess in 2003 or 2004, the Today Show was doing a segment on poverty in the U.S. And they showed a family oh that had three generations living in a thousand square feet you know so oh my god that's tight but they had dirt all around their property you know it was a it was a nice size lot and their biggest complaint yeah. was they didn't have food but they had most of the people in the household unemployed and i was just sitting wow. there screaming at the at the tv it's like <laughs> grow your own food yeah well and you know seeds are such an abundant part of the system yeah that oh. they could have enough food for everybody in the neighborhood yeah, exactly. to make that one of their products, even on a thousand square feet or whatever their lot in the city. You know, this is what yep. we this is what we're finding. There are estimates now, Greg, that um, maybe up to fifty percent of the food is being grown in urban settings. Yeah, in many of the areas of the world now. And so, yeah, yeah, what you're talking about is coming true. People are figuring it out. And again, that's to to trust the brilliance. That can come up with the self-organizing brilliance that starts to show itself once people get set on this. First of all, they have to know they can do it. Second of all, they've got to have access to seeds and the few things they need. But then, given a little bit of guidance and help, man, they just take off. It's just great. Yeah. Stacy <laughs> says, Pro Specia Rara, is that the Swiss, saving organi Swiss seed saving organization? Yes. Excellent. Yes. yes. And Francois, a friend, and we're actually... We're actually going to talk to them about using some of their software so our site can come up to their standards. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. Terry. Terry's in seed school right now. Good job, Terry. Armenian cucumbers come in pale green or dark green with stripes. Will there be a difference in seed saved from each kind when they come from the same plant? Interesting. I think, yeah, I think the question is, would the seeds be different? You know, in other words, if you save seeds from, you know, a pale one versus a green striped one, you know, and planted those, would they, you know, grow what you got? And I'm not sure. 
Yeah. I have not grown Armenian cucumbers enough to know. Um, my guess is that, uh, no, they'll all be the same. But unless you've got different varieties, I mean, if they're coming from the same plant, they're probably going to be the same. Yeah. And Terry, let us know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now you got a big experiment. <laughs> Save some seeds from each, grow them into separate plants, and see what you get, and let us know. That's what yeah. we're all doing right now. Right, exactly. And there, you know, and you know, I I have a pretty good understanding of what to expect, but I, you know, the more I do this, Greg, the more humble I get about it. I know, right? I I just I just keep getting surprised. So I don't know yep. enough about your where you got the seeds, what exact varieties. There may be different kinds of Armenian cubes than I've ever seen before. I just don't know. Well, but have fun a, with it. Yeah, exactly. Have fun with it. Here's a very interesting experiment I'm doing regularly here at the Urban Farm. I have had Rio Red cow peas, which I got from Native Seed Search down in Tucson about 10 years ago, and they grow wild in my yard. And what I've noticed is the past few years, they've start, they used to start growing in June, so they'd make a great ground cover. Now, some of mm -hmm. them aren't starting to sprout until like September. Wow. Yeah, so, so I don't know. What... So the seeds stay dormant through the summer and then come up in September. Yeah, and in the past they've been they've been heat tolerant and you know grown. So I think what I'm going to do next year is actually start some inside in June because I want them for shading the under under canopies of my fruit trees. Right. But see, life is searching out. You know, we're finding that with the grains. People say, oh, is that a winter wheat or is that, you know, a spring wheat? You plant it in the spring or do you plant it in the winter? Well, let the wheat decide. Right, exactly. <laughs> let your cowpeas decide when they yeah. want to grow. They're just searching out another season. Maybe it'll work. I don't know. Hey, Bill, I'm actually really excited about this. A couple of our questions have come from Stephanie in San Luis, Costa Rica. Welcome, Stephanie. Oh, great. Yeah. She says, what are some ways we can save seeds in humid tropical conditions on a shoestring budget? Well, I'm afraid people are saving, you know, the seed savers in the world have always done it on shoestring budgets. So don't yes. let that be, you know, don't let that be a thing. You know, the number, your big, you know, enemy, it's not an enemy, but the thing you'd have to deal with is the humidity. Yeah, exactly. You know, because seed, seeds like to be cool, dark, and dry. So whatever you can do to keep your seeds dry. And so, you know, those little silicone bags that come in every electronic device known, you know, and the, the, that pills. Pills. what's that, Greg? I, and most vitamin pills. Vitamin pills have them. Yep. You know, maybe you can ask around your community. Maybe it's so shoestring you don't have access to those sorts of things. Rice helps. If not, rice will absorb moisture. You know, so you can put a bag of rice in and around your seeds, so that will at least absorb part of the moisture. Clay helps also. I mean, there are a number of devices, you know, that are being made. They may, they actually make filters now that filter out moisture that they put into coolers to help dry the air out. That's your big problem. I mean, otherwise, seed saving is, it's not a problem. And, you know, one of the things I'm learning here in Arizona is that you may not be able to grow and save the seeds to everything that you want. You know, you may have to at least learn to be successful with crops that grow and work there and their seeds don't mind that humidity. That's the one approach. I mean, when I was in the Philippines, what they wanted, they wanted to grow and save seeds to carrots and celery and other things that were brought, you know, by the colonialists that, that governed the island for so long. They were never part of their indigenous diets there, carrots and celery and, and arugula and, and broccoli and cabbage and those sorts of things. And so when you, when you try to go saving seeds to those things in a place like the Philippines, it gets to be really interesting. One of the things that's a problem, and maybe this is something that you're up against in Costa Rica, is that things like carrots will not go to seed unless they go through a cold period. Carrots are biennial, and so it'll grow up. The, it'll grow the first year and grow a carrot, and then the second year it'll use all the energy stored in that carrot to produce a flower that then produces seeds. Well, it will not flower that second year unless that root has been cold. They call that vernalization. And different carrots have different periods, and um, you kind of have to play around with it. But you know, the, my poor friend farmers in the I, they're not poor, but they were poor around this issue. They were trying to say, get their carrots to go to seed and they never would. Same with celery. And it wasn't until I told them they needed to put it in the refrigerator for a month. They would actually harvest the carrots, 
put them in damp sawdust or sand, put them in a refrigerator for a month at about 40 degrees, and then pull them out and then plant them again, and they would go to seed immediately. That's what I call on a shoestring. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. anyway, so you, you can save seeds to everything, but start with the easy ones. If you have more specific questions about specific varieties, you're welcome to email me, all right? I'll just end that question with that. Cool. So I've got several more questions here, and they require short answers. Otherwise, we're going to end up going okay. another, another hour. Stacy right. from Paul's Church says, is Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance Seed School appropriate for anyone regardless of where they live? Well, it is for some things. Yes, it is. We've had people come from all over the world, yep. people of all ages. You know, we have an 11-year-old that was maybe one of our best students ever. Nice. Probably. We had late 60s, early 70-year-old Greek farmer come, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, I think there is something to learn. I mean, our seed schools are not just to teach you how to start down this path of saving seeds. I mean, that's a lifetime to be a great seed saver. We can get you started for sure, anybody. But it's also to make you a good seed citizen, to help you interface with your community and the world around you so that we all can have the resources and share them that we're going to need to get by. So in that sense, it can help everyone. Yeah, exactly. It Definitely, Stacy. it would be well worth your time. And I will follow up with your other question in an email, Stacy Gay from Sedona says, does the rest of the world or international countries have law that state the genetic material can be patented? She thought it was the U.S. Supreme Court decision, not international. Well, this is what I'm saying is that the World Trade Organization, through an agreement they call TRIPS, and you could look that up for the details. And I don't understand all the details of TRIPS. But basically what it says is that you need to recognize the U.S. level of patenting that was uh, approved by that Supreme Court case. If you want to engage in international trade, you don't have to. But if you want to become part of the world trade, then you need to recognize the intellectual property rights around plants in this way. I'm simplifying it a bit, but that's generally what goes on. Now, there is an exemption for countries if they really don't want to recognize utility patents. But as I was saying, more than 40% of the countries in Africa have signed trade agreements that do recognize utility patents. So there you go. So Linda from Ashfield is in the Seed Saving Online course, and she has a question. She lives in western Massachusetts, fairly short growing season. She's interested in the Siberian tomato. Are they good starting it indoors? Yes. Excellent. You know, tomatoes uh, are actually perennial plants. You can grow them for years indoors mm -hmm. if you have enough light in a pot. <laughs> I had a I, tomato plant a in the front yard here at the Urban Farm that lived for three years. I saw a Sasha's Altai one time that was 13 feet wow. that had been growing for several years in a condominium in Sun Valley, Idaho. <laughs> but they do start well indoors, and we usually yeah. start them indoors. And many Siberians started their plants in little greenhouses or somewhere so that they could take advantage of their short growing season. So, yeah, they, you know, try not to disturb the roots. You know, and I, I always had better luck if I didn't start them too early so that they didn't get root bound before I transplanted them. There you go. Stacy from Falls Church says, any advice you have for starting a seed library? And I give you one URL for that, Bill. Yeah, seedlibraries.net. There you go. Elizabeth. And if you have follow-up questions, let us know. Yeah. There are 82, 82 seed libraries now on the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance directory page. You can find through our website, and you can pull up a map of them and click on any one of those, and the, the contact information for that library comes up. So find one that's near you and get in touch with somebody who's close to you, and they can help you maybe the most. This is an interesting question. I sometimes hear about breeding cucurbits at home because of some toxin that can build up. Is there any reason to worry about that? <laughs> well, there's no reason to worry about it. It's a, it is a reality. It turns out that it's a recess, hidden recessive gene a deleterious recessive, a breeder would call it. And it was originally in the wild 
QQ Bert that gave birth to all of the different varieties that we have today. And it was basically a pest repellent. It's, it's, they call it the bitter gene. And it can actually, you know, make you sick if you mm. ate enough of it. But it's usually so bitter that you wouldn't. You wouldn't so need if it. you find it, if it does rear its ugly little head, and it does from time to time. It happened to a client of mine once when I owned High Altitude Gardens. If it does, let me know. You know, I, I, I know the people to contact who would love to know that sort of keep track of it, but it's pretty rare. You don't meet, in my 40 years of gardeners, I've only meet, met three or four people that have ever had personal experience with it. So I really wouldn't worry about it. Perfect. Terry from Aurora, Colorado, uh, harvests seeds and wants to know the best op- optimal seed saving method. He says there, he or she, I'm sorry, says there, uh, is conflict of information on ideal storage. Cool, dry, can dry versus freezer, mayonnaise jar versus paper envelopes versus shoebox. Does the, <laughs> this vary by seed type or is there a best system to use? I actually want to answer that and then I'll let you answer it. Go cool, ahead, dark, please. Cool, dark, and dry in a freezer in a glass jar. Yeah, there you go. They all, you know, all those methods they mentioned work and seeds are probably better than all of it. I mean, you know, it's pretty amazing. They're pretty amazing and durable systems. So the absolute best one for each different kind of seed, I don't know. That's, that's yeah. a really great question, but don't overthink it. Clay jars work um, in homes that don't get over 80 degrees too. Yep. Yeah. There you go. All right. I think we are done here, sir. Great job. Love oh. that we get to have these uh, monthly seed conversations. Yes, me too. I think it's great. And uh, keep the questions coming, everyone. I see the day now where we will do the whole show will just be questions. And that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Any final thoughts? You know, don't give up. (laughs) Go home and save some seeds. The world would be a better place. And that is, I'm, even after being at the, in the middle of the United Nations best attempt of the countries of the world to come to some sort of an agreement about how to go forward and feed people, I come away more and more convinced than ever that the real, the only way forward is to grow and save your own seeds and to inspire and teach as many people around you to do it also. And we can all do that. It's really a simple answer to all of these problems. How we get, it's really complicated to get the world to wake up and realize that's where it should be putting its resources. But I really believe that's the case. So thanks everybody for listening. Amen to that. And as I like to always say, farm out and we will catch you on the flip side. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.